She was a beautiful lady, and she was a lady all the way through. She was hardworking, and she always had a good word to say about anybody. And she would do anything she could to help anybody. Oh, she had such a good disposition. Nothing seemed to bother her, and she had lots of things that should have bothered her. I never remember her saying anything bad about people, anything about anyone that was a different race or a different religion. She seemed to be ahead of her time. I would say uh, long before mixed marriages or free love came into vogue, um, she accepted things. She didn't expect you to be something you weren't. And she just accepted you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Even when I got older, if anything was bothering you, you could always go and sit and put your head on her chest. And you always felt better when you got through. She could make anything right, anything at all. Catherine Foley, age 18, female, single, gave her occupation as servant and said she could read and write, that she was a British subject of the Irish race, whose last permanent residence was in Ireland in the town of Kerservine. Her destination was Boston, Massachusetts. She had a ticket to her final destination and had paid her passage herself. She arrived in Boston with only $15. She had not been to the United States before and was on her way to join her aunt, Abby M. Golden, in South Boston. She was five feet three inches tall with fair complexion, fair hair, and blue eyes. No marks of identification. She was born in Kerservine, Ireland, and was traveling together with at least seven other young people ranging in age from 18 to 25. Catherine Teresa Foley was born on December 16, 1894, in Kerservine, County Kerry, Ireland, a small town on the inlet to the Atlantic Ocean near Valencia Island on the southwest coast. She was baptized on December 18, 1894, in Fillmore, County Kerry, Ireland. Her parents were John J. Foley and Hannah, or Joanna, Golden. She had at least three brothers, John Francis, James, and Patrick and two sisters, Helen and Mary Ann. Doing what had become a family tradition since the great potato famine had struck Ireland, she raised a cow and sold it to pay for her passage to America. She never saw her parents again. By the time she could afford to visit Ireland again, they had already passed away. The passenger list of the SS Franconia, which along with its sister ship Laconia, were passenger ships in the Liverpool to Boston service. It arrived 7th of May, 1913, at the Port of Boston, with Catherine Foley listed as a passenger in the steering class section. It was requisitioned as a troop ship in 1915, and was torpedoed in 1916 by a submarine east by south of Malta. I never remember her saying about coming over in the boat that it was so hard, and I know it was from anyone you've talked to. She came steerage, and they didn't have a lot, and it... it was uncomfortable to sleep there and it was dirty and they had only the food they brought with them and uh, she never complained about it. I don't know if she ever went on a boat again after she came over the first time. At the time of the 1920 census she was living as a boarder in the house of Elizabeth Erhard with her sister Helen and John Menninger, a man 36 years old she would marry later that year, on October 20th, in the Cathedral of the Holy Cross in Boston. The ceremony was small, involving only them and two others as witnesses.
John was a cigar maker who worked nights tending a bar owned by John Connolly in South Boston. His parents were John Menninger of Chester, Pennsylvania, and Catherine Johnson of Iowa. Together they would have nine children over 18 years of marriage. Arthur George, born on February 12, 1922. The first child born to the couple did not live past 1932. He contracted pneumonia at the age of 10 and died after almost a month in the hospital. With so many kids to take care of, Catherine couldn't visit him every day as she wanted to. Helen Teresa, born November 16, 1922. Arthur had called her Nina, a nickname never explained, but used for the rest of her life. She never left her mother or married, and worked during World War II at the Watertown Arsenal, a job that required an oath of secrecy so holding that even before her death in 1991 of cancer, a disease she might very well have contracted due to her military work, she never told exactly what her duties were. After the war, she went to work at the Sears Catalog Building, near Fenway Park in Boston. Emily Clementine, born July 20, 1924, while the family resided at 19 Bryant Street in Everett, Massachusetts, a small city north of the Boston city line. She married Vincent Nicholas Cheery, and the two and their children shared a house with her mother and the younger siblings on Glendorf Street in Everett. When most of Catherine's children had moved out, they exchanged floors. Catherine and daughter Helen moved downstairs to the smaller apartment. For much of the time, both households lived together. There was a lot of confusion with so many children yelling for their mother all the time. It was impossible to tell if the calls were for Catherine or Emily, so an alternate system came into use. Emily Cherry became known as Little Ma, being the younger, and Catherine Foley was named Big Ma, a name which became so associated with her that by the time of her death that was the only name many people knew her by. John Joseph, or Jack, was born on December 21, 1925, and died in Malden, Massachusetts on January 16, 1984. James Christopher, known as Jimmy, was born on June 20, 1927. He worked at Hood Dairy Company and also tended bar part-time, like his father. Catherine Marie, or Kay, was born on April 1, 1929 in Everett, Massachusetts. She married John Santa Maria in 1952 and had two children. Donald Thomas was born on September 15, 1930, and had 11 children. He grew up to become the fire chief of their hometown of Everett. William Austin, born August 29, 1932, was ordained a Catholic priest and later became a Trappist monk at a time when becoming a monk meant the likely possibility that he might never see his family again. His gift with words, spoken and written, took him out of the monastery and all over the world, and he was able to see his family often over the years. Patricia Ann, born March 21, 1938, was the baby of the family, married in 1962, and had four children of her own. On December 28, 1938, only a few months after the birth of Patricia Ann, John Menninger fell down a trap door at the bar where he worked and was badly injured. He developed pneumonia and died after a short hospital stay, leaving Big Ma a widow and responsible for nine children and their well-being. And I remember, I was eight years old and my father was in the hospital and so she'd have to go up to Waltham and so, because there's three boys slept in a bed, two one way and one the other way. and. Uh, so I would, my father was in the hospital, so I'd be sleeping with uh, Big Ma. And I remember when she came home and she told me that she won't see her father again, he died. I really didn't know what she was talking about. But she didn't have to go to the hospital anymore. Big Ma was the mother and the father. And uh, Emily was great. I guess she was a single parent. We never thought of it that because she was a widow woman. But I'll tell you the truth, I never missed not having a father. 
I mean, I know other kids had it, but I never once in my life said I wished that I had had a father. It just, she just seemed to cover mother and father. And I know she worked hard, but she never really complained about the hours she put in. Uh, she just did it as a matter of course. She did what had to be done. She never dwelled on the sad things. I can't even really remember my father. I guess I was too young when he died. But like Pat was saying, she was a mother and father to us. And then I guess with all of brothers and sisters, you know, it makes us a family. She began to work as a cleaning woman and did home demonstrations to bring in enough money to keep the family together. She applied for her social security number and received it in 1952, continuing to work and support herself well into her 70s. All of her surviving children lived close by, and the family remained a tight-knit one for the most part. Despite the busy schedule, she managed to have many friends, remain social, and was able to make each child feel like an individual, not just one of many children in a single family. She was always working. My mother used to work too during the war. She used to go out with a woman at demonstrations. Her name was Broderick. And so if they were going to have a demonstration that night, my mother would go out and clean the whole woman's whole house that day. They always wanted a demonstration so they could get the house clean. She worked several jobs, but she always seemed to be home when you needed her. And I remember hating Wednesdays because she worked till night on Wednesday since she wasn't home for supper and it was an, it, everything bad that ever happened to me happened on a Wednesday because she wasn't there till I got old enough and then I used to go to work with her at Dr. Dana's. He used to give me a quarter for dust in the books and help cleaning the seats and working with her. Well, Big Mara and I had a lot of things we were close that uh, she didn't have with the other children. We used to go into the market district on Saturday during the Second World War. We used to get our meat in there and we used to get our vegetables and potatoes. And then we used to go into Hung Falo's Chinese place out on Tyler Street. It would be uh, 50 cents all you could eat. All it ever was was rice, but it was great. But we were when we were real young, my mother would take one of us, like for one day, she would take us into Boston, or she would take us on the boat to uh, Nan not Nantucket, what was it? Nantasket. Nantasket, yeah. And I remember one time we went into Boston and we ate at a Chinese restaurant, just her and I, and it was really unusual to get my mother along because there was always so many kids around. But she would do that and sometimes we'd go down to Salem Willows for the day. We went every place by bus that you could go by bus because nobody had a car then. She was a lot of fun. I always, we used to go into Boston twice a year. We would do our shopping in the spring for all the birthdays and in the fall for all the Christmas gifts. We'd go to Jordan's and have them sent out and then we'd go to a restaurant, we'd have our drink, and we'd have our meal, and it would be a whole day in town. And we looked forward to it all the time. Always enjoyed my time with her. And even when she got older, she was always good company. As she grew older, she began to have health problems, her strong constitution always bringing her back to independence, time and time again, until February 9, 1985, when she passed away during a hospital stay at Wooden Memorial Hospital in Everett. During a life in which she outlived her husband and three of her children, struggled to come to America and raise a family as a single mother, she was never known to complain, fall prey to negativity, or stop moving ahead. I can remember she's always praying. I can remember, like when she was even in the hospital, 
And the nurse would ask her to pray. She says, I'm getting so tired. You always want me to pray for them. I said, Mom, you know what you do? I said, I'm an angler. I said, just include all of their names in one prayer and then get on about your own business. You don't have to pray, uh, say a rosary for everybody. But that's the way Big Mom was. She was a good lady. She was always so good to, to take care of. You know, she had a, a nice attitude. She knew what was happening, but she tried to make it easy for everybody. And we still miss her and talk about her a lot. She was a beautiful lady, and she was a lady all the way through. She was always good to give whatever she had, she gave, which is unusual considering how hard she had it in it. But whatever she had, she shared. She was, she was a really, what you would call a true Christian woman. She, she just was a good person. The best person I think I ever met in my life. And I've met some pretty good people. I just always used to wish that I would be as good a mother as she was.